All right. Well, it looks like quite um, a few of the folks who have registered are here now. So thank you so much for joining. It's really great to see you here. Um, I'll just get this set up. All right. Um, yeah, to kick it off, I just want to say thank you for joining. This is the first of three 2022 Cayuga Lake Watershed Network Community Conference sessions. Um, we're really excited to bring this program to you today and share the important work that's being done to control hydrilla in our lake. Um, our goal um, as the Watershed Network is to really keep the watershed community um, informed and engaged in the work that's going on. Um, yeah, so I do recognize uh, many of the names here uh, of participants, but for those of you who I haven't met, I'll just take a moment to introduce myself. Um, my name is Liz Kreidinger, and I started in March of this year as the new steward um, for the Cuga Lake Watershed Network. Um, my background is in environmental science and watershed ecology, and I'm really honored to be able to be leading this organization and advocating for the watershed that is our home. Uh, and also new to the network is Molly Newman. So Molly is our program associate who will be very involved in our communications and community outreach efforts. Molly is going to be helping today, collecting questions from the chat box um, during the presentations, as well as facilitating the Q&A panel at the end. So thank you very much, Molly. We're excited to have you on board. Uh, before turning this over to the panel of speakers, I want to just set you up with a little more context of, about the role of the Cuga Lake Watershed Network in the hydrilla management um, on Cuga Lake. So the network has been involved in outreach um, uh, around hydrilla and Cuga Lake since it was first found here in 2011. And under the leadership of our past steward, Hillary Lambert, we've organized teams of hydrilla hunters and volunteers, published over 50 articles, press releases, and hydrilla newsletters, um, run radio and social media campaigns, uh, maintained lakeside information boxes, and held stakeholder meetings like today's end of season session um, that you're about to see. So um, we're really looking towards next year at this point about how we can continue these important local programs and keep the community informed and active um, in the hydrilla management detection uh, and control. So that includes um, dedicated hydrilla program funding because it really takes a network with lots of organization, people and resources to keep this aggressive plant from spreading further in our lake and our region. Um, so, and this is a uh, need for widespread collaboration and resources is really why the Cuga Lake Hydrilla Task Force was created. Uh, all these stakeholders work together to implement um, the 2021 through 2026 hydrilla management plan for our lake. And today you'll be hearing from speakers from the agencies um, listed here on the left. So first we're going to hear from Sam Beck Anderson. Sam is the Associate Director of Invasive Species Programs and coordinator of the Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, the Finger Lakes PRISM. Sam will be giving an overview of the Finger Lakes PRISM, their role in hydrilla work on Cuga Lake, and the importance of prioritizing prevention in regional invasive species management. Then we'll hear from Kate Monticelli, who is the hydrilla program manager at the Finger Lakes PRISM. Uh, Kate will give an overview of their control activities on our lake and an update on the results from the field team surveys. Next up, we'll have Mallory Broda. She is the program coordinator for the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and H Historic Preservation's Watercraft Inspection Program. Mallory will tell us um, more about their coverage on the lake, the decontamination stations, program findings, and public response. And find, uh, after Mallory, we'll hear from Richard Ruby, who is a fisheries biologist with the US Army Corps of Engineers, 
Rich will provide an overview of the CORE's hydraulic control activities and results of treatment from this year. Uh, and then we have Mike Robinson, who will uh, be uh, who began earlier this year as the new DEC Region Seven Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator. Mike will update us on the role, the new role of the DEC in this program um, this year, his work, and then uh, some thoughts about looking forward. So everyone um, is welcome to submit questions during the talks through the chat, and Molly will cl collect them uh, for during the panel discussion at the end. To keep the program running smoothly, we ask that you keep your microphones muted during the presentations, except at the end um, when we're going to invite some open questions um, and discussion during the Q&A panel. So with that, I will hand it over to Sam. All right, can everybody hear me and see my slides? Looks great. Um, hi, everybody. Like uh, Liz mentioned, my name is Sam Beck Anderson from the Finger Lakes Institute and Finger Lakes Prism. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks to Liz and Molly and the network for putting this opportunity together for these different partners to uh, come together and discuss this important project. Um, from my perspective, you know, this is a, is a great example of how different partnerships can and, and really should be coming together to work on a uh, towards a collective goal. Um, so just to give sort of a really brief overview of kind of our host, the PRISM's host, the Finger Lakes Institute is a not-for-profit um, department of Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. Um, the Institute has a number of different program areas in areas of focus from contaminants to nutrient loading and of course invasive species um, in, in uh, looking at those different program areas the institute uh, carries out a number of different uh, activities including uh, research education and outreach um, management and control of a number of different areas, uh, all looking back at the water quality and uh, sustainability of the water shed here in the Finger Lakes region. Um, the Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management um, is the uh, one of eight different prisms uh, throughout the throughout New York State. We are essentially from uh, this center of the state here. Um, this is a really uh, is one of eight regional partnerships is an integrated approach to management that focuses on leveraging partnerships and resources uh, among different partners and stakeholders throughout our region to um, look at and, and uh, try to achieve um, common goals and, and high priority goals within the region in invasive species. So we do focus on terrestrial as well as aquatic invasive species. Um, of, of many different kinds and projects of all different areas. So again, we are also take part in a number of different uh, activities when we're trying to um, fulfill those, those duties, uh, including outreach education, uh, prevention, containment uh, management, and early detection and rapid response of, response of invasive species. This is a highly visible program that really does build community awareness uh, and uh, uh, participation at its core. Um, this is a close-up view. So uh, with sort of that stuff um, built up, you know, thinking about the, uh, the regional context or starting to touch on the regional context, um, we'll just give, a, again, a, a really brief overview of what an invasive species is. I'm assuming most people here do know what it is, but just to make sure we don't uh, go for an entire hour or so talking about it, we we without kind of mentioning what an invasive species is, we'll just give a, a really brief overview at the top. An invasive species, of course, is one that is uh, non-native to an ecosystem under consideration and provides um, some kind of impact to the uh, economy, environment, or human health. There's a ton of different uh, options and kind of uh, examples of these different impacts within the, the um, different categories, and there is some overlap to be clear. So I'm um, thinking about there are some environmental uh, issues and impacts that could also kind of be considered economic impacts, things like uh, agriculture, uh, wood forest products, trade and shipping, um, and of course, uh, human health. There are some uh, 
plants and animals that will ultimately actually directly affect humans. So um, when we're talking about invasive species management, um, but presentation is complete without the invasion curve. Um, this is a really good visualization of how uh, what a, a way to really focus on actual management of invasive species infestations over uh, over time. So at the on the x axis here, you have time um, where all the way on the left here, where a species is absent, um, moving into different levels of uh, introduction and different levels of establishment of an invasive population uh, within a landscape. So as time goes on and the establishment of an invasion of an invasion um, increases in intensity or space or a combination of the two, um, the approach that should be used to actually manage that invasive species um, does change. So at the beginning, before an invasive species is present, you should be really focusing on prevention. Um, this is the best kind of use per dollar um, in terms of uh, actually in managing an inv invasive species. So just it is a lot cheaper to manage a species before it gets here than it is uh, at the end here of this of this curve. Um, as the population increases uh, or becomes more widespread, um, your chances and of management change and your reasonable management uh, approach should change. So eradication, um, once an invasive species is there, but it is in small enough populations uh, or scope, it is still reasonable to eradicate some invasive invasions. Um, beyond that point, um, you're really just looking at, a, uh, an, at an infestation that you may not be able to eradicate it, but you can actually contain it and sort of stop it from spreading. Um, and all the way on the right here, we're looking at a, an infestation that is totally widespread and, and taken over landscapes. Um, this is asset-based protection. So really what we're looking at is kind of focusing on just um, keeping things under wraps and controlling what we do have. Um, the topic of the day here in terms of invasive species is hydrilla. Uh, as its namesake, uh, this invasive uh, macrophyte is uh, super damaging to a number of different elements and uh, um, attributes within a uh, habitat, um, including it is uh, effects to actual water chemistry, but also uh, affecting the physical attributes of a habitat that create things like fish spawning sites and and so on so uh the attributes of a of hydrilla are consistent with uh, other invasive species of course able to grow in a number of different uh, habitats and, and and physical attributes within a water column um uh, it, excuse me it uh rapidly grows uh up to uh, up to an inch a day, can grow in low light conditions, um, and just has the ability to spread uh, very extremely rapidly to a point where it has the ability to totally take over a landscape um, and impact all kinds of things, uh, including um, creation, tourism, fishing, um, what have you. So um, hydrilla growth, uh, this plant grows in water depths uh, below 25 feet. Um, reproduces by seed, turion, tuber, and fragmentation. It forms dense mats, again, going back to that impact to habitat, uh, and grows up to nine meters in length. So this is all information that's really important to sort of um, informing, uh, whether it's outreach or informing the actual management treatment of uh, hydrilla within Cayuga Lake. This is all, these are all things that sort of come into play here. So um, thinking about hydrilla and identification, if anybody doesn't know what it looks like yet, this is a, a couple of good things to be looking for. Um, of course, there are a number of oops, uh, native and invasive lookalikes uh, within the Finger Lakes that are easily mistaken uh, that you can easily mistake for hydrilla. Um, and these are just a couple of things to really be um, looking for here. The four whorls of leaves, um, leaf margins are uh, serrated. I think there are some other lookalikes that have much more finely serrated teeth. This is, these are really, uh, you know, prominent teeth. And of course that presence of tubers and turions is another important thing um, to be looking for. So thinking about our, a regional context um, for the, from the standpoint of the Finger Lakes Prism, um, we cover a really large geographic region with a lot of high priority water bodies uh, surrounding Cayuga Lake uh, and other populations of hydrilla within our 
a region. So thinking about why we care about this so much, of course, other than the fact that um, it is affecting, you know, the, you know, on a micro scale, the, the areas, recreation, habitat, um, and fishing resources that are, uh, you know, so important for Cayuga Lake. We're also really concerned about the potential for this plant to spread to other areas of our region and really to the rest of the state as well. So um, what we know of uh, the travel, um, you know, habits of boaters within the Finger Lakes is that there are uh, people that use a number of our different Finger Lakes. So people aren't just coming to use just Cayuga Lake or just Seneca Lake. People that live on Cayuga Lake or near Cayuga Lake aren't just using Cayuga Lake. In many cases, um, our watercraft steward data shows that a lot of these people that are using Cayuga Lake, the most common next, ne the next common a water body for them to be using is a nearby Finger Lake. So this is a, a figure that shows just the spread of kind of the people that uh, are using Cayuga Lake and then within two weeks, under two weeks are going and, and traveling to another body of water. So this is for example, C Canandaigua Lake, just a few lakes over. Um, this is this data from two years ago. We recorded 8,000 watercraft traveling between Cayuga and Canandaigua within two weeks. So this is a huge number uh, and a huge um, you know, opportunity for hydrilla to spread and something that we, you know, find a really important point to, um, to be thinking about. So in that context, you know, as many of these sites do not have hydrilla yet, we go back to that, that, um, that curve, the invasion curve and think about prevention. So prevention is protection and money saved um, at the end of the day. So how do we kind of approach uh, uh, prevention in the Finger Lakes prism um, through a number of ways, you know, a, a really um, early detection and outreach. I'm just going to talk about a couple of these specific programs that we have uh, that really do focus on prevention. So really just trying to keep um, hydrilla from spreading away from the established populations in Cayuga Lake, for example, uh, and throughout Cayuga Lake as well. So Excuse me, I know Mallory will be talking about steward program, so I won't get into too much of the nitty gritty, but this is just a, a brief overview of our 2022 coverage for uh, Cayuga Lake for our watercraft steward program. Um, we're at five launches kind of at the north end of the lake here. We also have a macrophyte survey program where we engage community members uh, to actively uh, collect data um, within kind of their, their home region. We had five volunteers uh, and a watercraft steward actually submitting data this year um, for that program on Cayuga Lake. Um, we had a number of invasive finds, but didn't actually find uh, hydrilla, of course. Um, this is a really great program, A, to get people involved um, and interested in invasive species, but also does extend our ability to actually collect data about uh, invasive invasions um, throughout region and of course here on Cayuga Lake. So other outreach efforts running out of time here, but um, we did a water chestnut pull. This is a really common activity that we do again to get people involved. We bring volunteers in to pull water chestnut. We get people involved in um, invasives in general and always we're combining especially kind of localized information. So uh, a water chestnut pull on Cayuga Lake, we're absolutely gonna be providing information about hydrilla. We covered two major fishing derbies in this kind of uh, general outreach. You know, we had a table here um, at two major fishing derbies on Frontenac Park uh, this year. We're at a number of regional outreach events that not only do focus again. There are some focused ones uh, within Cayuga Lake, but really this this regional coverage that we have of outreach events helps kind of provide a holistic approach to getting the word out about invasive species. And going back to some of that earlier content that we have about uh, hydro, we're consistently uh, providing that information. We also have a number of regional billboards that we've worked with local partners on. So at the end of the day, outreach, education, um, getting people involved, and actually being out there boots on the ground, focusing on educating people is one of the, the really main ways and one of the main ways that we use to actually prevent uh, the spread of hydrilla invasive species in the region. And that is all I've got. Thanks again for having me. Thanks so much, Sam. So we'll have Kate share her screen next. 
All right, can you see my slides and hear me? Looks good. Awesome. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks for organizing, Liz. This is great. Um, so as Liz already introduced me, uh, I'm Kate Monticelli. I'm the Hydrilla project manager, um, hosted of the, the Finger Lakes Prism, Finger Lakes Institute. And uh, I've been working on various aquatic invasive species control projects in my time at the FLI, um, but I started working on Hydrilla uh, since about 2019. Um, can I, there we go. So Sam mentioned a lot of great programming that we have uh, to educate people about hydrilla and prevention strategies, um, but we've also been awarded funding for control and monitoring of current hydrilla infestations, um, specifically on Cayuga Lake. And with that funding, we're, we are coordinating treatment for a couple of the populations, um, monitoring the, the plant growth at each site, um, tuber sampling to monitor the hydrilla population within the infestation area. Um, and then we also have some field teams that do surveys uh, to try to find any new populations. Um, and we, we prioritize sites uh, based on the proximity to known infestations. So absolutely, we are doing a lot of surveying within Cayuga Lake uh, to try to find any new populations outside of the existing ones. Um, any connecting water bodies, and also using um, the watercraft steward data that Sam showed a great map of. Uh, when recreational boaters are traveling, are using Cayuga Lake recreationally, and then traveling to other water bodies, where are they going? And then we're also going to prioritize um, sites on those water bodies to look for hydrilla as well. <clears throat> so just to start off with our uh, management efforts, um, the map on the right here shows uh, the the four hydrilla populations on Cayuga Lake um, where management has occurred, and our funding has uh, addressed the King Ferry and the Lansing hydrilla populations um, that are circled in yellow on the map. Uh, in King Ferry, um, we had a, a team of two people doing a survey around the perimeter of Cayuga Lake, uh, and they found that at a very small private marina, there was uh, some hydrilla. Um, so that was detected in fall of 2018. Um, we were able to coordinate uh, a management strategy uh, for the following spring. So when the lake levels were low, um, we contracted with a company to actually dredge that very small area. I think it was 0 0.03 acres. Um, so removed uh, the sediment and had it, you know, trucked away to an upland site to be buried. Um, so there's no chance of reintroduction at that site. Um, it was then followed up with a, a contact herbicide treatment coordinated by the Army Corps. Um, and we've monitored that site since those control those control strategies were done in 2019. So in 2020, 2021, and this past year in 2022, we have not found any hydrilla there. So that's good news. Uh, for Lansing is yet another private marina. Um, it was initially reported uh, late summer of 2019, um, and that site was a just a five acre area really contained within that marina. Um, we've never documented hydrilla outside of it. Uh, so that, that first uh, herbicide treatment was a contact herbicide just to knock back the growth. Um, and then since then it's been treated using a systemic herbicide called fluoridone um, each year. And the map on the right here, uh, see the Got boxes in the way. Uh, in 2019, um, all of the points in purple were points that where we had detected hydrilla. Uh, the orange points were 2020, so it was really only hydrilla in the little attached pond um, at the west end there. And in 2021, there's a few more points um, of hydrilla within the marina, 
Uh, but then this past season, we did not find any hydrilla. Um, I don't know what happened. All right. Um, we've we've done tuber sampling uh, in the spring and fall, uh, along with the treatments um, to monitor the hydrilla population in Lansing. Uh, have not found any tuber samples either. And so for our field season, we had uh, two field teams um, going to each of these prioritized water bodies and sites, uh, performing point intercept surveys. Uh, using a rake toss method. So that's um, like a garden rake, uh, a two-headed garden rake thrown into the water and pulled up to see what plants are growing. Um, on water bodies that have no known hydrilla populations, we use 100 meter grid uh, spacing. So one rake toss every 100 meters. And we're targeting that growing depth range um, that Sam had mentioned up to 25 feet of water depth um, with our surveys. And we're, we're also targeting you know, boat launches and marinas, expecting that that would be um, the pathway of invasion. On water bodies with hydrilla populations, um, specifically Cayuga Lake, we have a much smaller grid size, a 25 meter squared grid. Um, so we're taking a lot more rake tosses in a lot smaller area just to try to find that needle in a haystack. Um, and then if there's any you know, big weed beds that our team happens to see uh, in the course of them completing the surveys, they take extra rake tosses too. Um, so for this field season, we are able to do surveys on 12 water bodies that amounted to over 12,000 rake tosses uh, in 75 days in the field between uh, June and the end of October. Um, and from these surveys, we did not find hydrilla in any new water bodies. Um, just zooming in a little bit onto Cayuga Lake, over 7,000 of those over 12,000 rake tosses were done on Cayuga Lake. Um, the two hydrilla control sites, King Ferry and Lansing, we did weekly monitoring. Um, and so over a thousand rake tosses were done just at those sites, just to watch for any hydrilla regrowth after those treatments. Um, and then the rest of our rake tosses were completing uh, point intercept surveys. Um, our field teams were also uh, able to assist uh, the Army Corps monitoring efforts uh, in Ithaca and Aurora, which I know um, Rich will be talking about in a little bit. Um, from what we found, uh, the most frequently observed species is a great native species, American eelgrass. Um, starry stonewort was the next most frequent species, and this is across all of our survey sites. Um, on Cayuga Lake, we were able to identify 35 submerged macrophyte species. Again, American eelgrass and starry stonewort were the most frequently observed species. So that's pretty typical for the region. Um, and then I think for the fourth year in a row, we've also detected the state endangered spiny naiad, the picture in the upper right. Um, so that was nice to see again this year. As far as invasive species go, um, here's the list. And then the, the seven species that have a star next to their name are the ones that we detected on Cayuga Lake. So not that the populations are large, just we did happen to see them in the course of our surveys. Um, and then outside of our point intercept surveys, we also uh, utilize some other strategies. So visual surveys, um, some of our team was scuba certified, and so we were able to do some scuba surveys, uh, really targeting the existing hydrilla populations to try to delineate uh, the extent of them. Um, so we tried some scuba surveys around Lansing, our control site, and we did not find any hydrilla uh, outside of that marina. Um, and then I think last year, um, it was presented that uh, hydrilla was kind of expanding at north of Aurora a bit. And so we were able to 
uh, do some scuba surveys in that area to help delineate that population um, that Rich will probably talk about as well. And then when the when the water conditions were not, you know, completely were were not very suitable for scuba surveys, um, we did some visual encounter meander surveys where we have the motorboat driving transects, um, doing rake tosses and dragging the rake to see what comes up, and we were able to kind of get a better idea of where hydrilla was growing at the north end of Aurora that way as well, um, and also. Uh, there was a report of hydrilla at Sheldrake Point, um, which is the map on the right here, the point at the, the bottom of the map. Um, and so we coordinated with the DEC's team uh, to help confirm and delineate that population. Um, so it was a lot of great work that our team was able to do this year. Um, looking ahead, we're anticipating continuing controlling and monitoring those hydrilla populations, surveying areas that are susceptible to spread, and uh, providing the educational resources and programming that Sam had mentioned. Um, and I guess one thing I'll plug is that we do have a Gmail account that if somebody thinks they see hydrilla, but they're really not sure if, if that's what it is, if you want to take a picture of it, email the photo and location to flxplantid at gmail.com and we can try to identify it for you. Uh, and so I think that's all I have. So I'll stop my sharing. Thanks so much, Kate. Great, so next up we'll have Mallory. Looks good. All right, sorry about that. My mute button got hidden by my presentation. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for joining us here today. I'm really excited about this meeting that the networks put together. I think it's really awesome that we get to kind of see everything today from um, prevention side of things all the way up through those who are doing management. So like Liz said, my name is Mallory Broda. I'm the coordinator for the ESF and New York State Parks Watercraft Inspection Program. And Sam had kind of mentioned earlier that they also have a watercraft inspection steward program, but I'll give you a little bit more information about our program. Um, they run really similarly. There's watercraft inspection steward programs across the state. The program that I'm with was born as a New York State Parks Watercraft Inspection Program back in 2014. And in 2018, it switched over to being a program run by SUNY ESF, and that's where I'm out of. Um, SUNY ESF was just kind of the more permanent location for the program. It's located more centrally, and we work in partnership with New York State Parks to get this program running. So you can see in the bottom right of the screen, this map of all of the locations that we were at in the 2022 season. So kind of across the state, um, and I'll zoom into our Cayuga Lake coverage on the next slide. Um, so Sam again said that um, stewards are doing a lot of this prevention work. So a bit more about that. The stewards are located at boat launches um, throughout the summer doing education and outreach work and their main duty is to do these voluntary watercraft inspections. So what those are are they're going up to boaters who are launching and retrieving their watercraft um, and asking them if they can just kind of talk with them about invasive species and what they can be doing to prevent the spread. They're also collecting some data while they do that. So when they go up to the boaters um, they're talking to them about um, spread prevention measures, showing them how to do this watercraft inspection, asking them if they're familiar with invasive species, um, and just kind of collecting information on what they're doing at the launch. And then um, we'll put all of that into the survey that the stewards have preloaded and give them any information on questions they have, you know, maybe if a species was found on their watercraft. We also have these really nifty um, freebies that we give out. So we have some stickers and some keychains that kind of stay clean, drain dry on them. And hopefully those serve as a reminder to folks to be doing these watercraft inspections. So, you know, they're seeing them when they're going out on their boat. So our coverage on Cayuga Lake, we have four launches that we've been covering since back in 2016. We're at Cayuga Lake State Park right at the top of the lake. We're at Dean's Cove State Boat Launch, Deganic Falls State Park, and Allen H. Treeman. We have four stewards who are spread across those launches. So we have one steward who's full-time at Cayuga Lake State Park, 
We have two stewards full-time at Allen H. Treeman because we operate a decontamination station there. And then we have one steward who rotates between Dean's Cove and Teganic. Our stewards are working Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day weekend. So kind of throughout the busiest boating season during the summer, our hours are 8 a.m. until 6.30 p.m. and they're working Friday through Monday. So kind of over the weekend, we're hoping to get folks um, on those busiest boating days of the year and interact with as many people as we can. So a bit more about our decontamination station for those of you who may not be familiar. It's pretty much like a pressure washer that has the ability to pump out high temperature water. So the station that we have is a Landa Ecos trailer unit. It was purchased back in 2018 um, for use at Allen H. Treeman, um, hopefully to prevent the spread of the known hydrilla populations down there out of the lake. And um, we're doing decontaminations focusing on folks who are maybe going from Cayuga Lake off to different areas of the state that do not have hydrilla. So these decontaminations are voluntary, um, only if folks are willing to do so, but our stewards do offer them to everybody who is heading out of the lake. And folks seem to be really kind of with it, especially down in the Ithaca area, are willing to participate, are happy to get this free boat launch, um, and there's been really good reception to this unit. So our reach at launches. This is kind of some high level data just from our launches on Cayuga Lake over the past eight years. We have done over 30,000 watercraft inspections on Cayuga Lake at those four launches, reaching over 70,000 boaters, which is awesome. Um, and from those 30,000 inspections, we have found 3,202 total aquatic invasive species. However, none of those have been hydrilla. I do have a photo on the right that is of hydrilla. It's the only time anyone in our program has seen it, but it was not from a watercraft inspection. One of our stewards was doing a totally different project while he was at the launch, um, doing presence absence rake tosses right around Alan Treeman. And he happened to pull it up, but it was from a known population and it was reported as well. Um, and like I said on my previous slide about the decon station, folks seem to be really um, receptive to what our stewards are doing. I find especially down around Ithaca at the lower end of the lake, it seems like folks have been getting a lot of messaging um, surrounding hydrilla, surrounding invasive species. In this past year, we had a 98.7% acceptance rate for watercraft inspections. And our stewards are there doing these watercraft inspections um, and that's really great. And we're there a lot of the time and interact with a lot of folks. But the goal of the program is really to change the behaviors of these boaters. So back in 2020, program statewide introduced this question that's at the end of the survey. The stewards are asking boaters if we can count on them to clean, drain, and dry their boat even when a steward isn't present. So um, since that question was introduced back in 2020, we've had over set, or almost 7,000 boaters to commit to doing that. So that's awesome. And again, the last side was just some really high level data. We do put together reports that are kind of more specific to our launches. They talk a bit more about um, what folks are at the launch to do, how many boats are coming through launches per day. If anybody is interested in this um, closer look at the launches, I'll have my contact information on my last slide and I would be happy to share these. For the coming seasons, I'm happy to share that our funding has been secured for the program through the 2027 field season. We do have plans to continue staffing those four launches on Cayuga Lake. Um, our decon station unfortunately was down for the 2022 season, but it just got back from the shop and it should be fully operational through 2023. Um, and if anybody is interested in getting our position posting, have somebody that they think would be interested in the job or maybe a listserv they'd like to send it out to, again, feel free to reach out and I would be happy to put you on our list to receive that. And here's my contact info. And that's all for me, thank you. Thanks so much, Mallory. So next we'll have Richard Ruby. Rich, could you go ahead and share your slides? Great, and just unmute there. I think we'll be all set. There we go. 
There we go. Thank, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Liz, and thank you, everybody, for uh, for this. Uh, we look forward to actually this opportunity every year. We've been doing this for the past several years, and I think it's a great opportunity, uh, despite the fact that uh, Michael and Kate and I spend a lot of time together out in this during the summertime. It's kind of nice to actually interact with the, all the other partners that we do uh, in a more infrequent basis, and also to make sure. Uh, we get the good information out there of, of what we're seeing, um, both the, the good news of the successful stuff as well as some of the, the bad news. Uh, basically, these this infestation being a lot more uh, um, very uh, unique and, and uh, its ability to uh, hang on and, and to move into other areas. So uh, I'd like to, aside from, uh, aside from the the Finger Lakes Institute and DEC that we work hand in hand with, uh, also the stewards obviously is uh, like to thank them as well as Tompkins County Soil and Water, Tompkins County uh, Department of Health, uh, Water, excuse me, and Health, the Cayuga County Department of Health, the local governments, including uh, City of Ithaca, as well as the uh, City of Aurora, that we work really closely with, especially when we're developing these treatment plans uh, each year. So. Uh, this project uh, wouldn't be uh, able to be run without those partners, but also with uh, Mike Greer, who used to be our regional tech technical specialist and actually stepped up to now be the national program manager for the ANS and aquatic plant control uh, research programs out of our in, uh, engineering and uh, research design center out of Vicksburg, Mississippi. He's still local, um, so he still interacts and still keeps touch, but it's kind of nice having um, someone with his experience that, that has the local knowledge that now is up at the national level that hopefully can help out with uh, some of the issues we see as well as being a really good uh, person for keeping tabs on um, treatments that are going on around the country and also keep us up to date on those those methods. I also can't can't uh, say anything without my uh, my right hand person, uh, Mike Voris. Mike uh, has been working on this project with me, and uh, I'm the lead for the Cayuga Lake work. Uh, Mike is actually our lead for our Erie Canal work in the western part of the state. So he's my backup, and he's out there every day in the field with me and helping deal with the field crews and everything else. So uh, a big shout out to him as well. Uh, the goal of our project, which is uh, pretty much uh, underneath the aquatic plant control pr uh, program within the core, is uh, for the um, first off responsible use of well understood herbicides. One of the unique things with this plant is it's very difficult uh, to use some other methodologies to actually control it. So herbicides tend to be one of the better, uh, more effective ways to go at this and reduce uh, the chance of it spreading in that, which can happen when we use mechanical or some other uh, technologies. Um, they're still working on those technologies, but the, the one that is most readily available are these well understood herbicides. Uh, the second is obviously to protect and restore Great Lakes Finger Lakes, the, the Great Lakes area and protect them as well as uh, the Finger Lakes where this has gotten established, uh, not only to uh, reduce its spread, but also to reduce any impacts uh, within the both the ecological as well as the economic uh, impacts. Uh, the, the last, the second, or, or the third and last one is to obviously significantly reduce the risk of this spreading into other areas, which is one of our biggest concerns with this plant. The three herbicides that we use in, uh, in Cayuga right now are a contact herbicide, which is we use for spot treatments, and that's usually for areas that are outside of our treatment areas that we've identified from our sampling from the year before or from our early sampling during the year. Uh, that's harpoon or ach chelated copper. Um, that's for small, very localized spot treatments. Um, for the large, larger scale treatments, uh, especially given the fact that we work around potable water intakes in that, we tend to use uh, fluoridone in two of its forms. We use the sonar H4C, which is a pelletized form. Uh, which is a, a release, it releases slowly over time um, and stays concentrated on the bottom, which is where hydrilla tends to be concentrated and takes the herbicide in. This is a systemic 
herbicide that actually takes several weeks to months to uh, to actually have full effect. Uh, the other one is is sonar genesis is one that we'll use in more flowing uh, water areas like Fall Creek. This is pumped in with an injection system, and we maintain that injection system for several uh, for uh, at least a month, uh, a couple months throughout the season. Uh, the restrictions are are um, pretty limited, um, and in most cases, we're actually uh, applying these these products at much lower uh, um, rates than what are identified here. Um, and then we work very closely with the county health departments in that doing testing to make sure that we're staying uh, below any thresholds that you might have at any potable water intakes. So I'm going to start with Ithaca um, because Ithaca is a really good story. Um, this infestation came in uh, early in 2011, 2012 was originally identified. There was a large effort to do some control here. Um, we did start seeing it start to pop back up in small little spots here, uh, 2018, 2019. Um, so as a result, um, we were already doing work up in Aurora. So we came down and actually lended a hand both with uh, just monitoring that as well as with some funding to help uh, with the actual applications. Um, during that time period, since 2018, 2019, uh, it initially started with some patches in the Stewart Park area, right in the near Shore Lake area. And then we started noticing um, with the help of uh, Bob Johnson at that time and others that there was some uh, patches that were popping up in Fall Creek as well as in the Cayuga Inlet area. So as of last year or this past year, this is what our current treatment uh, looked like. Uh, we were treating in Fall Creek, and then you have the near shore area of Stewart Park. We also have some over here, some areas over in Treeman, and then some spot areas in the Cayuga Inlet itself. The Fall Creek area is actually, that's the one area where we actually use two two different forms of the fluoridone. Uh, we set up an injection pump here at the uh, overpass of uh, Route 13, and we actually pump uh, herbicide in at a rate of about 2.5 parts per million, depending on the flows. Average flows for uh, for the uh, Fall Creek during the, during the time period between uh, June and September is usually around 70, 75 uh, CFS. So we actually operated this. Now last year we had really wet year and a lot of uh, water coming down. So we had the injection pump actually had to be turned off for significant time periods last year. We still got a very effective treatment, but that I think is also due to some of the uh, turbidity and some of the uh, additional things that happened during that time. So the uh, this year we decided to prepare for that to actually have a setup. So we would actually run the, the pump for the first uh, up to an 80 CFS flow. Once it got above that, we would actually run a pulsed um, application, which means we would keep the pump on, adjust the flows, or adjust the injection to make sure we maintain that two and a half parts per million, uh, up to a, a flow of 160 CFS, and then above that we would shut shut the pump off. In between that range of 80 to 160, we would actually keep the uh, we would have that pump on for five days and shut it off. Uh, as it turned out this year, it was a great year, very low water um, and dry. So for the 77 total days that we could have applied herbicide, we were able to apply herbicide for 72 days. So we had a very dry year this year, more normal, I guess, or even a little drier. So we were actually able to get a very, very effective uh, application in the, into this area. For uh, Stewart Park, excuse me, let me roll right back one more thing. Um, in these adjacent areas that are off channel, this is the Golf Course Lagoon, this is Stewart Park Lagoon, and this little lagoon here off of Fall Creek, we actually do uh, a granular or a pelletized form of sonar uh, fluoridone. We apply there um, two applications. We do 10 weekly treatments to maintain an, uh, the herbicide between about one to three parts per million. And uh, we start with a higher dose and then we drop that down. This is a little lower than we normally will use in other areas, but that's because of the fact we're already applying a liquid herbicide in the in the main creek, and we're taking advantage of the fact there's already a concentration gradient there to uh, to work with. The uh, the next area that we look at or looked to treat was uh, the Stewart Park and the Cornell Community Sailing Club. Uh, 
We've gotten very effective control there over the past couple of years. Uh, last year, only having one uh, sighting of any uh, hydrilla here in the outlet of Fall Creek. So we reduced this area up, applied. Uh, it's about a 40 acre area here in front of Stewart Park in a 3.4 acre area here. Same thing, a 10 weekly treatments that started in June 30th and went till September. The, uh, the applications were over 10 weeks and we're trying to maintain that one to three parts per million, uh, taking advantage of the fact that we would have herbicide coming out of Fall Creek and the general flow here with the plume is to go down the shoreline in this way. So we actually used a slightly lower concentration here. Treeman State Park is on the western side of the inlet. This is the uh, west side of the Stewart Park in the outlet of Fall Creek. This, this we used a more traditional uh, application for what we would normally do for open lake uh, or near shore areas, which is to do two applications at what is the max label rate if you're dealing with any potable water intakes in the area. We do have some camps along here that have that. And then we have application. And then after that, we would do uh, eight additional applications at a slightly lower concentration, assuming that those pellets are gonna kind of add up and dissolve over time and, and maintain uh, a pretty uh, good level, trying to maintain that one to three parts per million in that near shore area. The last area that we treated was Cayuga Inlet. And the, this area coupled with Fall Creek is the only areas last year where we found uh, hydrilla in any significant uh, patches at Cascadilla Creek and Cornell Crew Bay. And then this is the outlet or the, uh, excuse me, the boat launch at Treeman State Marine Park and an area that we definitely wanted to keep uh, an eye on and make sure that we not only were reducing any chance of anything getting established there, but also to make sure that we're treating anything that might be brought in. Um, same application as we're doing in the near shore areas on the western side, which is 20 parts, two days, and then eight, eight uh, applications of the 13.75 parts. One last thing that we do is, is we do have spot treatments available to us. And this particular year uh, in, uh, in early October or in early August, uh, one of our local um, uh, representatives from Tompkins County Soil and Water was out actually putting up some signage and checking on the signage that we have to maintain while we're doing our treatments and noticed uh, a small patch of hydrilla here. Um, we were out sampling later that uh, later that month and didn't notice any, but as a precautionary measure, because this is an area we've had problems with hydrilla in the past, we actually went ahead and did a spot treatment of copper just to ensure that we got a good um, we got a good treatment in there um, this year. Very effective. Um, as I mentioned, uh, because we're using fluoridone and we're around potable water intakes, we do actually do um, weekly monitoring just to ensure we're not exceeding the 20 parts per billion uh, max uh, that we are allowed to do, as well as to try to ensure we're trying we're monitoring and getting that hopefully one to three parts per billion. Uh, this is showing you the different areas that we actually kept kept an eye on with these locations. And we you can see here is, is that we had a range uh, usually below one part per million or per billion, excuse me. But we had some some weeks where it, we had some drier times or we got some good retention and we actually would get up above that uh, three to five parts per million, which uh, parts per billion, which we were trying to maintain. Um, these were rare occurrences uh, on average. Uh, the most common was less than one part per million, but because we're right at the water surface or at the sediment surface with the plants, that's a, a good area for them to do. We also, um, or even though we're getting these low values, it's still, uh, we found in, in years past that we still do get some pretty good uh, effective treatments around there. And here in Fall Creek, as well as the inlet, uh, Treeman State Marine Park and Stewart Park, we actually had some of our best retention numbers uh, maintaining uh, very frequently values in the one to actually just above five in a couple areas here. 
This was an interesting area this year, this Treatment State Marine Park, this uh, site one. We actually had to stop doing weekly treatments a couple of times because the values were over 10 parts per million, per billion, excuse me, which we were not anticipating. I've never had in the past, but this year we got some really good retention uh, in these areas. So we actually did skip a couple of the dates just to let the area kind of settle and, and reduce in concentration before we reapplied again. Um, we do uh, the county uh, water department or the, the water treatment or water facility actually at Bolton Tory does do uh, monitoring weekly and uh, none of the values that they observed there were uh, above threshold levels of 0.5. So the, uh, I guess the, the take home message with this was we had a very effective treatment this year. We maintained really good levels of, of herbicide the only areas that we actually found hydrilla this year, because we got a well-timed treatment, we were out there, uh, the Fall Creek treatment actually started in mid-June because it warms a little quicker than the near shore and the inlet. So we actually were out there a little, a couple weeks earlier this year, got a good effective treatment in that area. Uh, the golf course lagoon area, which has been a difficult trouble area for, for the past several years, we did not see any uh, hydrilla there all year, which was great, meaning we got a really good effective treatment and we got one last year, which means we've really probably done a good job of reducing that, uh, that tuber bank. Uh, Michael Robinson will talk more about the sampling that they did down here and they did not find any tubers in any of these locations where we've had some trouble trouble uh, spots for the past few years, which is good, meaning we're getting a good, the tubers are there, but there are very low numbers than, uh, than what we would have anticipated based on what we were seeing when we first got out here. The uh, Cascadilla Creek area is, um, the outlet is actually uh, one of the other areas we were very concerned about. There's a, a marina right here, has a lot of uh, boat traffic. And so this area, we got very effective treatment. These samples that we found here, uh, where the last time we saw it was in, was in August. Uh, our, our fall samples in October and also some that were done in September were, uh, did not observe any more plants. And the plants we did see in there were very, very heavily impacted by, um, by the sonar that we were using in this area. Same thing with the Cornell Crew Bay area. We had a very effective treatment in there and we did apply that that uh, copper treatment as well just as a precautionary measure we didn't do it in cascadillo because we didn't have any observation there was one patch caught here in between these two areas in um in in August, excuse me, or July, um, this was not seen again. So this was could have been a small patch that actually, uh, due to uh, some of the treatments that we were doing there as well as turbidity, may not have survived that well. Um, we will keep an eye on this because occasionally we have had some points in here. So we're going to be keeping an eye on this area right here, which has been um, a trouble area for future. Now I'll switch gears and head over to Aurora. In Aurora. Um, we actually last year found uh, a bunch more hydrilla that had extended or we found a significant amount of hydrilla that had extended north of our original treatment areas was was the Wells College Bay Area here. Um, and you can see we actually extended our treatment and DEC was actually gracious enough to uh, jump in recognizing that this this area had become um, large enough that we really needed um, not only manpower to actually just monitor this, but also some additional funding to help treat this area. So we are jointly treating this area with DEC and coordinating with them, both the monitoring efforts, as well as um, some of the other uh, water sampling, which I'll show you just in a second. We took the Northern piece, which actually starts from Little Creek and goes all the way up uh, near um, to the North. And uh, the, it's a 58 acre area. We subdivided these areas into a shallow area and a, and a deep area. The shallow area were areas that were 12 foot or, uh, in depth or less and more near shore. And the reason we did that is we did a, no, a more normal treatment in that area, 20 parts per billion for two weeks, eight additional weeks at the 13.75. Um, in the deep area, because we, have seen hydrilla in some cases extend to deeper portions of the lake. We actually um, were concerned in trying to uh, extend the limited amount of funding we have to treat this and still get an effective treatment out there. So given the fact we this 
the, the authority we're working under is a, is a research and development or a d design type authority as well that allows us to try to deal with some stuff. We work with the, the chemical companies to try to find, um, to try to come up with an, a way to effectively treat these deeper areas and, and use less than max label rate on these. So what we did here is we actually, you'll see you have eight weeks of treatments instead of 10. And what we did was is because we're in deeper areas and the assumption is there's less mixing that's going on there, less current, um, and the plants are in the lower part of the water column with the pellet, they're actually, um, they're the, uh, what we did was is we actually calculated the volumes based on uh, a lower uh, parts per million than what you would, uh, we would normally do in shallow, shallower waters. But assuming that that the the majority of the herbicide was going to stay in that really low water area, and so we applied at um, this 10 parts per billion is assuming it's full water column, which is the way you would calculate that. But if you were to to actually look at the area, uh, half the depth of that area, and calculate that, these would be at 12 parts per or 20 parts per billion and uh, 17 and a half parts per billion. So it's kind of a weird way to deal with it, but what we were trying to do is have a higher concentration in those low areas, not exceeding the label, while at the same for four weeks out of the year, and then um, taking the next four weeks and actually applying it at a, a little bit higher level than we might when we are looking at the concentrations that we have in those lower, um, those lower water column areas. What we uh, what we found was uh, is really promising, especially with the fact that this population seems to it's much less dense. These are small patches that are hanging on into marginal habitats in these deeper areas, but it makes it much more difficult to treat if we're using the the same uh, application and and uh, both the concentrations as well as the methods that we use in the shallower areas because of just the water depth, the volumes and that would just increase the amount of herbicide. What we found was is that we got good retention of uh, herbicide in the shallower areas and actually in the deep area where we did this modified application, we actually got better retention of herbicide than we did in the shallow area. So this deep area here the values actually ranged very high. We have this one outlier, which is the 16.2 parts per billion. That outlier, we believe, was just a little sampling error. When we when the water sample was taken, it may have just hit the bottom and got and got or was over a pellet because we never saw any values after that that were larger than seven parts per billion. Um, and these are samples that were taken a couple days after the application of the herbicide. So what we saw was is we had a really good uh, maintaining those water, those concentrations at that one to three parts per billion in that deep area. And we got good, we still got good application concentrations in the shallow areas at one to two parts per billion. Uh, all the finished water samples, we do have the, the, the water authority at Wells College actually does do finished water sampling um, testing. Uh, that we pay for, and that also was less than 0.5 parts per billion. So despite the fact we're applying these herbicides in and around the intake, there is, it's in deeper water, and we have not seen any application of, uh, or any documentation of any um, herbicide getting into the water supply uh, above a non-detect level. The, uh, this is just showing uh, so we go out and do monitoring just like we do in, in, uh, in Aurora, or excuse me, in Ithaca, uh, with the help of both Finger Lakes Institute as well as DEC. And uh, what we found was is that this year, the percent occurrence of hydrilla was actually half to almost a third of what it was last year. Last year, it was just less than um, or right around 1% 1, 1 this year, we're down to 0.6%. So despite the fact that we still have hydrilla that's kind of expanding in its range a little bit still, um, and we're trying to get on the front end of that, the areas that we are applying this and, and actually going after this are actually working and we are seeing a reduction still in the actual percent occurrence of this plant. <clears throat> uh, this is definitely evidenced if we look at uh, that last slide was just showing the entire, all the hydrilla points that we found within our 185 acre monitoring area. If we look at the, the actual October sampling that we did, which is after our 
uh, treatments, you can see that any of the points that were within our treatment areas actually were no longer uh, observed. It was only those areas that were right on the fringes or the or uh, that were outside of our potential sampling area that uh, or our treatment area that were actually in uh, in play still. So this brings us to the the next thing. So we've got good applicate we've got good control still in the areas where we're where we found it and we're able to treat. We have a new potential method to treat these deeper um, these deeper plants that we're starting to find in these deeper areas, which is uh, really promising. Uh, this is only one year and one area that we've done this with, as well as with DEC. So there's still some testing in that that needs to be done now we're a wider range, but at least this is demonstrating that there are some ways that we can still go after this plant, uh, do it without using max label rate of herbicide and get very, very effective uh, application and um, maintaining those levels. The, uh, as you can see, uh, both, uh, or Michael will probably talk about, but also Kate mentioned that they helped do some additional scuba surveys uh, north of the area where we uh, have been monitoring. Uh, we found this actually all the way up to uh, Great Gully um, Cove Road from um, north of Gully Road, which is where our, that was the last uh, evidence that we saw it last, last spring or last fall, excuse me. So as of this year, we found more plants farther north. The, the, the nice thing, or not the nice thing, the thing to mention here is these patches are relatively small in size, probably haven't been there a long time. And we're gonna be working um, with our partners to uh, develop some application and treatment plans that hopefully will incorporate these areas as well, while still trying to maintain application in these areas to, to uh, keep control where we've, we've got a good foothold in the Wells College area, uh, as well as these, ex these areas that we just started treating over the last year or so. The uh, path forward, complete the data analysis that we have done for this past year, prepare our post-treatment summary reports, and we'll have those available at the end of the calendar year. Uh, we also, as we're um, looking at in, in Ithaca, we've got really good control there and we may be scaling back some of the lake wide treatments and actually concentrating our efforts in Fall Creek and on uh, the inlet where we know we still got patches and tubers that that'll be coming up in the next year or two. And then in Aurora, we'll be concentrating on this expanded area and how we can actually look to see if we get effective treatments and also prioritize some of these areas that we're finding to the north versus some of these areas that we already have good control on. Okay. Thanks so much, Rich. And thanks for adding yep. those resources and the links. We'll make sure all those are available on our website. Um, if you could stop the share screen, I think Mike will be able to share his. All right, looks good, Mike. All right, can you hear me? <clears throat> All right, uh, hello everyone. My name is Mike Robinson and I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for DEC's Region 7. Um, just a brief uh, background on me. Um, I've been doing natural resource management uh, activities for the last 15 years or so um, with an increasing emphasis on invasive species management in the last six or seven. Um, my current role uh, represents a regional expansion of the DEC's invasive species coordination section, uh, which as someone mentioned, began uh, this February. Um, and that being said, 2022 represents the first year in which the DEC has participated in the field activities uh, associated with this project. Next slide. Okay, so uh, just a brief overview of the DC's contributions to the project this year, and I'll go into a little more detail in later slides. Um, but we had one crew, uh, which included myself and four seasonal technicians. Um, 
We performed numerous point intercept surveys across about a dozen sites on Cuga Lake with over uh, 4,000 rake tosses and an additional 500 or so data points um, from a couple of supplemental snorkel survey events. Uh, we also oversaw a couple of subcontractors that each made additional contributions of their own. Uh, one of them was Solitude Lake Management, who performed the herbicide treatment for um, all entities involved, uh, despite being on separate contracts. Uh, they also did the notification and subsequent water sampling. The other contractor that we used was Northeast Aquatic Research, and they did um, additional point intercept surveys in Ithaca and also hydrilla tuber sampling. And they will be doing in the um, you know, post, post season, they'll be doing a plant community health assessments. Um, all right, next. Oops. All right, so here's just a overview of the DC uh, monitoring area there in blue or the, the large blue polygon is the monitoring area and the rest of those smaller polygons are the actual treatment areas. Um, this is, the treatment area is 123.9 acres. And as Rich already mentioned, um, he went into a lot of detail with the, um, the type of, the type of uh, herbicide we're using and concentrations and all that. So I won't repeat that again. Um, they also did the, the post-treatment water and sampling, as I mentioned. Um, you can see those, those yellow dots represent the water sampling points they took, and the purple dots actually represent um, other samples that were done for a harpoon spot treatment on that small uh, orangish red polygon on the north, north end of the map here. Okay, so this slide just kind of gives you a visual of some of the other additional high priority areas where we focused survey work uh, this year. Uh, that list of sites largely came from Finger Lakes Prism and represents, you know, high, high traffic areas uh, such as marinas, launches, uh, fueling stations, etc. Most of them are uh, include two or more of those. Um, amenities. We also uh, we also conducted surveys in the south south end of the lake, including the Merrill Family Sailing Center, Fall Creek, the Inlet, Cascadia Creek, and um, just the South Lake proper. And we did some limited surveys up near Union Springs as well, in an effort to delineate the uh, the hydrilla population that has been moving north along the along the uh, eastern shoreline there. Oops. All right, so here's our other contractor, uh, Northeast Aquatic Research. So they were largely out there doing um, point intercept surveys at a 2,040 points or so um, in the South Lake, South end of the lake near Ithaca. And they also, as I mentioned, did um, five, they were sampling for hydrilla tubers at five different um, sites that were identified by um, historical data as well as recommendations from the core. Um, so there in green, those green points, you can see those are the, um, those are the five tuber sampling sites, which as I mentioned, those either came from the most recent sites that had been sampled by the previous contractor, or um, you'll see like Cornell Boathouse, Ithaca Farmer's Market, Golf Course Lagoon, and Stewart Park. Those are all areas that Rich had previously mentioned as being um, you know, historic hydrilla sites, um, whether they were trouble areas or just where um, hydrilla had persisted through the years. Um, the good news is, is that out of the um, 250 total samples, so that's 50 cores at, 
at each of those five sites, we found uh, zero hydrilla tubers. Uh, so that's good news. And then also those 2,040 points out there on the lake, as well as um, all those other points that you see in the inlets and the creeks. Um, I know Rich had reported um, that they had found some points, I believe in Cascadia Creek area, but um, our, our contractor, as well as the surveys we did down there, we did not find any. So, you know, that just goes to further show that what is remaining down there is in low, low abundance. Um, and as I mentioned, they were also going to be doing um, Northeast aquatic research. Um, this, this survey that you see out on the South Lake um, is pretty much a continuation of the work that uh, Bob Johnson with the Rasin Johnson Aquatic Ecologists uh, group had done in the past. And uh, just to kind of further document impacts to native and non-native species in, in the context of the herbicide treatment. So, you know, by continuing to collect that data, we'll be able to uh, demonstrate, um, you know, whether there are in fact or are not impacts to uh, co-occurring species. Um, and from what had been collected in the past, it does not appear that there are uh, negative impacts, that is. All right. So, Again, this is back at the DEC monitoring area. Um, so here are the locations we found hydrilla within the DEC Aurora monitoring area in 2022. Um, as you can see, the vast majority of those hydrilla points are within the treatment area. Um, the four, four or five that are clumped together right in the northern section in the red, reddish orange polygon, um, those were found by CPRO, uh, the herbicide manufacturer, during a scuba survey mid-season. Um, these points, we were able to, uh, with Rich's help, uh, we were able to shift the, shift the treatment uh, slightly to encompass that new patch that was found. And that patch was inside the monitoring area, just outside the treatment area. Um, that is, that, you know, that's part of the reason we have a a buffer around the treatment areas is to catch uh, things that are growing out. Um, but anyways, so that particular patch received about half a season's worth of the fluoridone treatment. Um, so we also went ahead and hit it at the end of the season with a spot treatment of harpoon just to ensure that that patch was adequately treated along with the rest. Um, the yellow points at the southern end of the map are also uh, hydrilla fragments. I just, I put them as a different color because they were found in the really late season. Um, I think I put their October or later, but I believe they were found really, really late October or possibly even in the very early days of November. Um, that's right inside the Long Point State Park boat launch. Um, so it's not really surprising to find hydrilla there just because you know you've got boats coming in and out um, and because we know that we have hydrilla um, in that small patch just south of the launch as well as the treatment area to the north so that launch is sandwiched between two known hydrilla areas and just the nature of it being an enclosed launch uh, you know fragments of all types of plants tend to collect in there um, fortunately, also, because it's a small enclosed area, it shouldn't be too difficult to shift treatment to include that area um, if, if it's deemed that that's the, uh, the best path forward, um, which I don't see why we wouldn't. Um, all right, next. Okay, so I guess the the less, less positive news, which uh, I believe uh, Kate had touched on before, is that there was a report of hydrilla over at Sheldrake Point. Um, it was documented by a uh, third party 
person that was just out there doing scuba diving. Um, and so Finger Lakes Prism and DSC uh, went over there and did a bunch of rig tossing and drags and um, did confirm that there was in fact hydrilla there. Uh, you can see that we then uh, went north along, along the shore and south along the shore. Um, we found, we found it, well, there's actually a little more hydrilla in that blank spot. That spot is, that spot was surveyed, it's just blank because um, that, I think the Finger Lakes Prism has the, the data from that area. Um, the orange dots are the DEC survey efforts and yeah, the, we were basically kind of leapfrogging over each other as we went. Um, but we didn't find it any further north than Wires Point. And you can see we went another mile and a half north and about a, a little bit over a mile to the south of where we found the last hydrilla points. Um, so hopefully it is contained between Wires Point and Sheldrake Point. We also went um, even further north and checked out a couple of the, the high traffic um, docking areas. They're not launches, but there are a couple, there's a handful of wineries along that area where um, boats, I don't know, they have, they have dock service. So essentially those are higher use docks than the average uh, residence dock. But good news is we didn't find any additional hydrilla uh, beyond what you see on this map. Um, as far as a strategy for dealing with, with this, um, you know, it is on the other side of the lake. Um, so it would be a completely new area to treat. Um, most of us just came off of our field season and haven't had a, a large opportunity to collaborate with um, some of our partners so far. So we are still in the process of developing a response to uh, this infestation. Um, good news is, is that it was characterized by the diver as um, sparse, or the, the individual plants were very small in stature. Um, also, when we went up there rake tossing, we were only returning it on about, or, you know, we were only getting hydrilla on about 1% of our uh, rake tosses, uh, similar to what you're finding on the other side of the lake where it is being treated. Um, so that just kind of tells us that this infestation is still relatively low abundance, low density. All right. So um, kind of looking to 2023, uh, much of what we did in 2022 will remain the same as far as continuing point intercept surveys and treatment and the other services that were performed by our contractors. Um, as I mentioned, we're still working on fleshing out the details of treating uh, Sheldrake um, and, and those couple points that were in Long Point State Park boat launch. Um, we're gonna continue to work with our partners through the off season uh, to strategize our group's actions and how to best tackle these challenges. Um, things I would like to improve upon um, for my own team, just moving into next year is I, I plan on expanding my team's capabilities and performing snorkel and scuba surveys uh, to just add a finer scale detection to some of these high priority sites. Obviously, you can't cover nearly as much ground um, swimming around in the water than you can from a boat. So these would just, this would be limited to just, you know, really high, high priority areas such as scuba diving or snorkeling around launches um, and that type of thing. Um, and, you know, that should hopefully allow for um, increased detection when you have such low, um, low density, um, just low density patches of hydrilla um, in these new, newly established areas. Um, on the logistical side of things, um, we also just need to better streamline um, some of our notifications with stakeholders um, and contractors um, for when an application uh, would change. We had a 
one one snafu through the season that I'd like to do better. Um, and then, oh, just the, uh, in summary, I'd just like to briefly reiterate some of the reasons why we do the work we do. Um, I imagine that most of us, if not all of us here today are here because we value the natural resources we have and recognize they need and deserve some level of protection from external threats such as uh, invasive species. And whether it's uh, Cuga Lake or another Finger Lake or the Great Lakes, you know, we're fortunate to live in an area with such an abundance of the world's uh, fresh surface water resources. And, you know, just beyond the importance of drinking water, um, you know, we value our unique aquatic ecosystems, all the recreational activities they provide, um, and the economic values that come with living in an area with these resources. And while invasive species management is certainly uh, a challenging endeavor, um, you know, it's worth it. And the cost of inaction um, means that something like hydrilla could potentially spread to all those freshwater resources that I just listed. Um, and furthermore, while there are many official entities uh, involved in managing invasive species, it really takes uh, the cooperation of the entire community to stop the spread and prevent new infestations from popping up. Um, so with that, I just wanna you know, reiterate, clean, drain and dry your boats and equipment, um, especially when you're entering or leaving a water body known to harbor invasive species, which is most of them. And um, also just, you know, another way to help is to just help spread the word, um, whether it be your neighbors and peers who may have not um, received this information or don't understand the risks associated with um, not clean draining and drying. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Liz. Thank you. That's great, Mike. Thanks so much for the, yeah, the emphasis also on, on actions folks can take themselves. Um, great, I think what we'll do is probably have you stop the share. Yeah, <laughs> where did the meeting go? And then Molly has been collecting questions from the chat box. Um, so I'll turn it over to her actually, and she's going to start um, bringing those up uh, for the panel. I know we've uh, run a little bit longer than planned on the actual talk. So I'm gonna suggest that um, we go for another 10 to 15 minutes if the panelists are available to stick around. And then if we aren't able to get to some of these really good questions that have been shared, we can, um, the network will go ahead and keep those, uh, work up some answers and do a Q&A article in one of our upcoming newsletters. So thanks so much to all the speakers. I will hand it over to Molly. Thanks, Liz. And thank you, everybody. There are some really great questions in the chat. So hopefully we can get to most of them. I know there were some answers in the chat. So we're going to start with the ones that haven't yet been addressed. Uh, so the first one is from Frank Moses. And how will short winters and warm early springs impact the treatment outcomes and strategies? Um, and I think. Sam, maybe this is one you can answer. Um, <laughs> I would probably punt that to uh, somebody that is a little bit closer to the actual treatment side of things. If I had to guess, I would say Rich might Rich. have the yeah, Rich, best, is this some, most experience. Is this something the core is talking about? Uh, it's. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, it's uh you know something that we're uh we're keeping an eye on because uh what potentially will happen is is that it's just going to move that so the window that we have to treat hydrilla generally is we wait until it's it's uh, tuber has sprouted because once that tuber has sprouted it no longer it will not uh um sprout again so um 
there's a time window when that usually happens in Cayuga Lake. It generally happens within June, uh, late June, mid to late June. And depending on where you are, it's water temperature based. Um, so as that, if these water temperatures and if the, the we have shorter winters and a little bit earlier warmups in the springs, what's going to happen is, is the, the, the hydrilla is going to shift and start sprouting earlier in the season. It also potentially means that it's going to get uh, it's going to have a longer growing season, so it can even get larger in that one year and produce more tubers. Um, we generally try to hit the window between tuber, um, between when the tubers have sprouted and made it above the sediment surface and they started growing a plant to the end of uh, August when they start actually changing and putting energy back down into their root systems and start creating new tubers. So what most likely is going to happen if we have warmer uh, earlier springs and longer falls is that that time window is going to expand uh, when we can potentially treat it, but also means that they'll be the, the plants themselves can get much larger and produce more tubers over time. So we really have to hit that sweet spot. And it just means we may have to be out there earlier uh, in the season than we are right now. And Richard, there's a follow-up question to that. Uh, Michelle Henry wants to know, what is the water temperature that's kind of considered the sweet spot there? Uh, I believe it's 18 degrees C, uh, 18 to 21 degrees centigrade. So in the low 60s, uh, once it hits around 60 to 65 degrees, that's when it really starts to, and that's sediment. Um, temperatures. So that's uh, definitely uh, what it's, you know, so sometimes the surface water will be much higher, but in these sediments will take a little longer. That's why generally Fall Creek, we are in there a couple of weeks earlier because it warms up faster because of the runoff from the, the stream and the fact it flows through Ithaca itself. And so it's a little warmer water usually than the, the lake proper is. So, um, but yeah, if you start looking at temperatures in the, the mid sixties, um, the, the low to mid sixties, that's when we're gonna start expecting those tubers to start sprouting. Thanks. And for our next question, um, this is about the inlet in Ithaca. So can, can we, provide some insight on the status of hydrilla in regards to dredging the inlet um, and what effect would dredging the inlet have on the eradication of hydrilla there? Richard, I think that might be another one you can shed some light on, although <laughs> punted if I'm wrong on that. No, that's that's all right. I know, uh, I know the city, uh, Roxy, actually has mentioned that there's been some discussions and, and that um, depending on when the, the dredging actually would occur, uh, preferably at a time when the, the plants are not growing, which would mean a, a fall, a late fall to uh, winter time dredge. Uh, you actually could uh, harvest those tubers out as long as you're making sure to, to capture that material uh, and make sure it goes into an area where it's not going to get back into the water and it's going to be disposed of properly. You potentially could actually reduce the amount of tubers out there and actually potentially enhance that. The, the problem is, is that dredgers usually don't like to be out there in the middle of, you know, in that, that cold weather actually doing their work, they'd rather do it in the warm months, which unfortunately for us means now you potentially not only have tubers there, but you also have sprouted hydrilla that you're going to get fragmentation from. And it, those fragments could potentially very easily, especially depending on time of year, uh, reestablish. They can establish from a one to two inch piece of plant. And if they sink to the bottom and get enough sunlight, they can re-sprout and generate a whole new plant. And if there's enough growing season, these things can grow several inches a day. They can get enough energy to be able to put tubers into the next, uh, you know, by the end of this, uh, by the end of the fall, and it can become a big problem. It's one of the reasons why harvesting is uh, actually not good for many of the invasive plants, but especially with hydrilla, because all it does is actually aids its ability to spread and to become much more dense during the, during the summertime, so. And for my next question, um, for Cayuga Lake, is anyone totaling the cost of control efforts since started, as well as related exit survey efforts to prevent from uh, going to the lakes and then the associated impact on fisheries and related tourism. So this is also from Frank Moses. And if uh, Frank or anyone else whose questions I'm repeating, if you want to elaborate on your question, please don't hesitate to unmute. Thank, thanks, Molly. Uh, I guess I guess the first one's the control cost since the, I, I know it was uh, related to the counties taking on some of the costs and then and transition to Army Army Corps. Um, just just understanding what 
you know, the one lake uh, control cost has been in terms of uh, it's helpful having conversations of the importance to prevent hydrilla from coming into the lakes and that number uh, can really help, uh, you know, advocate for that importance. Uh, but then, you know, Sam mentioned the, you know, different economic impacts and, and with hydrilla impacting our fisheries and, you know, uh, which is related to anglers and tourism, you know, which is a tougher number to get after, but just broaching the question of are, are we paying attention to uh, tallying those quanti you know, those costs that are quantifiable? It seems to me the, the control cost is probably uh, an easy number to, to get after. And then if there's specific, uh, you know, the hydrilla task force that's doing the exit surveys on Cuga Lake, because of hydrilla that you can probably figure out what that's cost over time. Uh, but then the other stuff gets a little, uh, you know, you can be creative with your math and uh, it's not always, you know, uh, the, the best numbers, but but still important to, to broach. Um, so I, I hope that makes sense. And I don't know if anyone has the answer <laughs> right now. Uh, yeah, I can take a stab. Or, or I, I think get the answer. That's um, a really good question, Frank. I think short answer is uh, if you're looking at like a full meta analysis, I would say no. I think, like you said, the control kind of like output efforts and, and costs, I think, are a lot easier to quantify. Um, but I think even those, you know, I, I don't nod my knowledge, you know, the different partners have kind of like uh, combined those, not that I know of. I do think you're right, that idea of looking at kind of, you know, almost like an opportunity cost of, of protecting, you know, another lake. I, I think that's a really good point um, to, you know, solidify that importance of prevention. I think it's probably a really good uh, project for like a grad student or something like that. Yeah. Um, but if anybody does have some <laughs> answers on at least the control cost, uh, please please email me. That'd be very helpful, and maybe that could be shared in the newsletter or, or wherever yeah. wherever appropriate. Thank Frank, you. I I'd actually had an information request from a few years ago, so my numbers are are definitely outdated by this point. But I think the estimate that we'd come up with, um, again, like three or four years ago. Uh, spending across control projects that occurred in the Finger Lakes region were like three and a half million dollars or something like that. Um, but then I also wanted to share a resource in the in the chat here so that you'll all have the link, but the Great Lakes Hydrilla Risk Assessment does include an economic evaluation um, as a section within it. So I'm gonna put the link to that down here as well. Great, thanks Kate. Yeah, right now I'm just going off of past Ithaca journal articles of, you know, this uh, 900,000 was given uh, from the EPA, which, you know, breaks down or uh, 350,000 was spent in 2014. And, you know, it's just, it's just good to tally the, since the program started, uh, what, what it's cost through the years. Um, yeah, the, the numbers are definitely yeah. out there for that, but because there yeah. are so so many people involved with with all of the projects. It's it's definitely hard to track down an actual total. <laughs> great, thank you, and thanks for all the great work. This is this is a really really wonderful opportunity. Appreciate everyone putting this together. So it looks like we've got about time for one more question for today, and then of course we'll we'll make sure we get answers out to everyone else in the newsletter. Um, so has New York State considered a truly rapid response for new find of hydrilla to stop spread while treatment plans are developed? Um, and then for example, some states will close a launch in a day or two of a find. And this is from Roxy. Uh, I guess I'll speak to that. <laughs> um, so, I don't know that uh, there is specific guidance, um, at least in this particular project, there was not specific guidance to, um, like, for example, react immediately. Oh, Kathy, my boss here to save me. Um, yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Thank you. 
So I do want to mention that we do not have the authority to close launches at this time. There is no legal entity we can use to, to get that done. So I, I realize that that's a source of frustration for quite a few people, but we just don't have the authority to do that right now. And it, I'm assuming though, that if, if it were a private launch, that would be a different story, but a public launch, we definitely cannot do that. Thanks, Kathy. Roxy, does that, does that fully answer your question? Did you have any follow-up to that? Well, I have to find my mute button, sorry. Um, oh, it's all the other buttons. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I know uh, I know DEC doesn't have the authority. Um, and, and for this one in particular, there are all kinds of authorities and state laws that weren't given or that were uh, like actually blocking some responses. And a lot of that was changed, uh, which is great. I wondered if anyone um, has discussed with, I guess, the legislators uh, giving that authority. Uh, to, to the EC, um, or if maybe someone needs to bring it up to legislators. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. We'll, we'll have to see how things move forward, but it's a good point to make. Um, how are we doing on time? I think, Liz, you think we've got time for one more, or should we wrap it up? I can go ahead and wrap it up and we will just um, yeah, pay extra attention to the remaining questions that we had from today. Um, so let's see, I will share screen. Okay. I just wanted to thank the speakers for taking their time today um, to talk to us and to everyone who attended and for listening and asking those great questions. Um, you can stay connected uh, with us by visiting our website at www.cugalake.org. And the recording of um, this and all of our conference sessions can be found on our YouTube page, and there's links on our website as well. Um, so we also have two other upcoming sessions. Uh, on December 5th, uh, so that's Monday next week, I'll be presenting as part of the Wells College Sustainability Perspectives Series on the work of our organization. And on December 14th, Howard Goebel, the Chief Technical Officer of Canals for the New York State Power Authority, will be the speaker for a session on water levels in Cuga Lake. Um, so uh, last but not least, if you value the work that the Watershed Network does for our community, bringing together these stakeholder meetings um, and outreach during the year, please consider joining. Uh, we are a grassroots membership-based organization and your memberships and generous gifts are what sustain our work. Um, and I guess finally, I would just like to remind everyone to clean, drain, dry. And um, you'll be hearing more from the network uh, in 2023 as this program continues. So thank you so much for joining today. And we hope to see you at some of the upcoming sessions. Thanks everyone.